Well, there was a young evangelist in the 1930s. Uh, he founded a church, a growing church in Toronto, and was also a vice president for Youth for Christ. He was a prolific orator, and his best friend at the time happened to be Billy Graham. He, ap he actually enlisted Billy Graham to join him on these revivals as they preached the God's word through the United States and around the world. And at the time, if they were Batman and Robin, Billy Graham would have been Robin to Charles Templeton's Batman. Chuck, as he was affectionately known to Billy, uh, was somebody he looked up to and profoundly admired. So it was strange to Billy when Chuck came to him with rising doubts uh, and concerns with his belief in the Bible. As he studied the world of wisdom, he started to not only question his beliefs, but really, really start to question his, his, uh, the truth of the Bible as God's inspired word, when science seemingly refutes it at every turn. He thought to himself, how can God create the world in six days? Or how can the sea be parted? How can all the animals fit on a single boat? Or an individual live inside the belly of a well for three days? How can there be a God amongst the evil of the Third Right? How can a God supposedly allow these atrocities to happen to his own people? These were the mounting concerns that bubbled up in, in Chuck's heart that he could not answer, and neither could his friend Billy. So Chuck went on to resign from his church, from Youth for Christ, and decided to study theology at Princeton Theological Seminary, where the liberal professors there cemented his beliefs and his growing unbelief of the Bible. He started to learn from the strongest voices on the other side, teaching false doctrine, people like the liberal Bible scholar and unbeliever Karl, Karl Barth. Billy, on the other hand, was elected as America's youngest college president, leading Northwestern Bible College and was invited to the annual college conference, Forest Home, it's a retreat center east of Los Angeles. He was always nervous to be around big intellects, and especially this time, knowing that his friend Chuck would be in attendance as a speaker. Chuck came to him with the same passion that he once had for Christ, telling Billy that he was about 50 years out of date, that no one any longer believes the Bible as God's infallible word, that his faith was just too simple, that he needed new jargon if he wanted to be successful in ministry, that his old-time religion belongs on the top of the trash heap of history, and that he felt sorry for Billy. A friend later came to uh, Billy and said that he overheard Chuck say that Billy and him were just on two different paths. Billy, 30 at the time, not too late to quit and join the family business as a dairy farmer, took a walk that evening in the woods. And as he walked, he thought through the questions Chuck had raised and his own growing doubts. And as he walked through the woods, he saw a tree stump shining in the moonlight, not unlike the one he used to stand on and practice preaching when he attended Florida Bible Institute. He put his Bible down on that stump, knelt down, and prayed. He asked God questions similar to Chuck Rose, that he couldn't answer these philosophical questions. He couldn't answer these rising doubts created by science. And he felt the Spirit of God speak to his heart to tell him that God would give him a belief in God's Word a belief that would go, on, go beyond any doubts that he may have, and that he would stand and commit himself to following God's infallible word. See, a spiritual battle had been fought in Billy's heart, and by the Holy Spirit he'd won. Not soon after, he went on to preach a revival in Los Angeles that launched his crusade ministry. 
he committed himself to the study of God's word and the proclamation of his gospel. Chuck, on the other hand, spent his life in search of the wisdom that the world had to offer and pleasing the flesh. You see, even somebody as renowned and respected and looked up to as Billy can have questions and doubts, even searching for a sign from heaven to reassure these doubts. This moment in the woods was a pivotal moment for him, and where we find ourselves in the narrative of Matthew is a pivotal moment as well to Jesus' disciples. If we turn again with us to uh, chapter 16 and verses 1 through 12, we find that Jesus, after the feeding of the 4,000, is off the coast of Magadan. As we look back at what has conspired up to this narrative to this point, we find Jesus feeding the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, the walking on water, and the many miracles performed by Jesus. All the people of the land were in conversation over the man who had power over nature, calmed the seas, power over the evil spirits as they listened in fear of him, power over the blind to restore sight, to restore hearing back to the deaf, to heal the lame and the sick. Even the Canaanite woman proclaimed that Jesus was indeed the son of David. As we read, we will see three different conversations going on. The Pharisees and the Sadducees with Jesus, Jesus and his disciples, and the disciples amongst each other. So starting in verse 1, we see the Pharisees and Sadducees come up testing Jesus, asking them to show them a sign from heaven. And our title this morning is Discerning the Truth of God in the Midst of Changing Times. And our timeless truth is beware of sign-seeking and false teaching, but be aware of sound doctrine and righteous instruction. We see these two diametrically opposed groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, come to Jesus asking for a sign. The Pharisees held uh, popular support because of their religious piety. The Sadducees, on the other hand, held political power. The Pharisees actually mean separated ones. And they believed in all the Torah, along with all the prophetic writings. Uh, they believed in the oral traditions held by their rabbi fathers. They believed in the resurrection and also were searching for the coming of the Davidic Messiah. They were what you would call the conservatives. The Sadducees, on the other hand, if the Pharisees were conservative, were the liberals. The Sadducees only believed in the Torah, but rejected all of the Old Testament prophetic writings, uh, as well as did not have belief in the angels, demons, or resurrection. And they were not looking for the Davidic Messiah. They were Jewish aristocrats. And they were in support of the status quo. We're referring to them as liberals because of the rejection of the resurrection of a coming Davidic Messiah, as well as the rejection of the Old Testament prophets. They were concerned with political power, and a Messiah would threaten that power. They had a bent toward Hellenism. And this concept of power is what brought both these groups together as they approached Jesus. Uh, they had heard, no doubt, the stories all across the land about all the miracles Jesus had performed and probably had a detailed scouting report of him. So as they approached him, all the prophecies uh, that Jesus fulfilled they probably, you can almost picture them sharing notes with one another before engaging Jesus. Can you imagine the Republicans and Democrats unified on a common purpose? That is what this was like. And they wanted to interrogate Jesus like a Supreme Court confirmation hearing. Their opening question was, 
for a sign from heaven. Seemingly wanting Jesus to put on a show, a performance, something miraculous right before their eyes. Jesus was not to be baited, though, and instead showed them to look at the sky and talked about the weather. Why? Why would he do this? Maybe it's because they were great forecasters of weather. They can interpret the signs of what's going on in God's physical world and had all of the tools to understand from the Old Testament who Jesus was, but they were still missing it. They were still missing the point, even though they had all this wisdom of the world. There was this old mariner saying that no doubt they knew that the sky, when the sky is red at night, sailors delight. But when the sky is red in the morning, sailors warning. Meaning that if the sky is red at night, the next day, clear skies. But if you see a red sky in the morning, that's a sign that a storm's a-coming. Now they knew all these things and had the scriptures, but yet could not see the sign right in front of them. They could not tell that a sign from heaven has been given to them already. And he was standing right in front of them. The sign was Jesus. Jesus is saying, I am this sign. But you're missing it because of your hard hearts. You're too concerned with the, your idol of power to even notice the, that your king, your Davidic Messiah, is standing right in front of you. God's only son came from heaven to fulfill prophecy and performed many miracles amongst them. Now there's two main threads in the Gospel of Matthew that he's been presenting to us. Number one is Jesus as Davidic Messiah and the fulfillment of God's promises. And number two, Jesus as Emmanuel, the presence and wisdom of God. Jesus has been showing the people that the end of the age has come in him and that the people of God are being defined as new. This time uh, that's spoken here in verse, if you go back to verse 3 towards the latter part, but cannot discern the signs of the times. This word for times is, this, is the word kairon or kairos. It's a different word from chronos, which is chronological time like on your watch. And its meaning is time period season or era, and this is what Jesus is talking about, that you cannot discern the time period in which you live in. That Jesus was establishing a new covenant with his people. Jesus is telling these religious elites that they were too evil and adulterous to even take notice. You see in verse 4, it says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it, except the sign of Jonah. This telling them they're evil or wicked and adulterous, and this word adulterous here, it's very important, is a term called moikalis. Moikalis means spiritual adultery. And spiritual adultery is a great theme that we see all throughout the Old Testament. Again and again, Israel turns from God to idols in an act of spiritual adultery. In Exodus, we go back to Exodus, we see God provide for his people in amazing ways. He sent the plagues to show his power, to free his people. He parted the Red Sea in a show of strength to show that he would care for his people. He provided a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to guide his people. He provided manna, and when they were tired of that menu, he provided steak, meat, and provided water to show that he would sustain his people. He provided a government to show his people how they should live. But yet, despite all of this, the people still decided to turn away from the living God and onto idol that was blind, deaf, mute, and lame. So they go to Aaron and ask, ask him to create a God for them 
out of their own hands. In Exodus 32. Let's turn there to take a look at what's going on. Exodus 32. Now when, starting in verse 1, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a goal, a, a God who will go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us from the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took them from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way in which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people. Behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make of you a great nation. Why would the people do this? Turn aside from a God that provided them for them in such a powerful way, led them out of the land of slavery, and was leading them to a land of their own. But still, they turned away and created this idol, this golden calf. They knew this golden calf did not have any power. So why would they do this? Real simple. This calf was a representation of the burning sin in their hearts. This calf was a symbol of the idolatry churning within their hearts. They gave themselves to their lusts in a manifestation of their sin. And there are very real applications from this story to this passage and into our lives today. Now this pattern in the Old Testament, we still see today. God provides in amazing ways. We see Him, we feel Him, we relate to Him, and yet we quickly turn aside to our idols. The great theologian John Calvin said that our hearts are like an idol factory, churning out idols constantly. And just when we think we've rid of our idols, our heart just puts out a newer model. Why? Why are we so tempted by idolatry? Let me put it this way. It's different from, we're not talking about idolatry that's a graven image. Idolatry today is of the heart. And our definition, working definition for today's purposes, is taking something that is good, excuse me, that is good, make it the ultimate thing, and put it in this, as the center of our lives, just like the golden calf was put at the center of the camp. This can look in various different ways. An idol can be turned uh, out of from our own children, something as good as our children. When we put them in the center of our lives, we make an idol out of them. The way this looks like is that uh, these children will grow up expecting the universe to re revolve around them. Or something as good as alcohol used for celebrations and toasting. When we put it in the center of our lives, we can't wait for the next time or always looking forward to the next time when we take another drink. Our thoughts are captivated by it. The reason why idols are so enchanting to us 
is because we think we can control them. We think we have power over our idols. And we know a sovereign, a sovereign God who will know more than we ever will, who is more powerful than we ever will be, and is in control over everything is something that we've secretly coveted since the Garden of Eden. With idols, we think we can manipulate them to get what we want and when we want it. Blessings from idols come easy because we think we can control it until that idol overtakes us, until the idol of children overtakes our time, our finances, it runs the household. Or when alcohol takes our friendships away from us as we try to appease this God of our own creation. Or even in 2018, an idol can be made out of our own pets as keeping us from going to different places because if we disturb their routines, it may create anxiety issues. The Pharisees and Sadducees were seduced by their own idols of power. The boastful pride of life was the altar they worshipped at. They were about being proud, about being the smartest, and coveted position, and Jesus knew this. They knew that they sought glory from themselves that was meant for God. They desired positions over power, and eventually they finally got what they wanted, or at least they thought. Both of them led to the crucifixion of Jesus. But Jesus rose again, pointing out that they would only get the sign of Jonah, which if we look previously earlier in the book, in verses 12, 39, in Matthew 12, 39, Jesus explains the sign of Jonah is his life, death, and resurrection. In true to Jesus' word, the Pharisees and Sadducees got the sign of Jonah, his resurrection. Playing the pawn for Jesus as he fulfilled the will of his Father. They had no response to Jesus. And we see them go away to, tell, uh, to go give their devotion to another. Continuing the story in verse 5, we have the disciples coming from the other side of the sea but they had forgotten to get any bread. In Mark's account of the same story in 8.14, it, he tells us that they actually had one loaf of bread. But this loaf of bread is about this size, cracker. Think of a cracker. And with 13 men, that just wouldn't do. See, when you're traveling back then, you have to make preparations for your travel. And, uh, and so, because there's no subway around the corner, you have to make sure that you have enough bread for your travel. And they didn't. So they think here when Jesus says, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, they think that Jesus is upset with them because they did not bring enough bread. And now they have to get bread from the Pharisees and Sadducees. And well, they had bad bread. This is what they're thinking. They're thinking the same physical terms as the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus, knowing this, tells them why, after all these things you've seen me do and provide for you, are you still seeing things only in the physical? And if we look back to uh, verse 12, we see they finally understood that this leaven of bread was about the false teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In Luke 12, 1, Jesus tells us that the leaven is actually hypocrisy. These Pharisees and Sadducees had a false sense of goodness or virtue while concealing their true character. They were concerned with protecting their own idols rather than knowing the Lord. We see this played out very well in Romans 1. In Romans 1, starting in verse 18, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, 
His divine power in, div- in nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. So this tells us where the idolatry comes from. These Pharisees and Sadducees, their bread, their leaven of bread, Jesus is telling us that this aroma can be sweet-smelling, filling the nostrils with delight. But it's false teaching. And even though it would pass the appearance test by Chef Mike Gantz, it is corrupted from the inside like a Christmas turkey from Christmas vacation. Legalism tries to take the reins and control of God through false piety by saying, hey, I look swell in front of others. And that is what the, the Pharisees were in danger of, is this sense of legalism. In today's purposes, we're going to look at what this leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees are and this hypocrisy hypocrisy of religion. We're going to look at it in various forms. We're going to look at it in three, three forms. Let's call it the religion of hypocrisy, along with its denominations. The religion of legalism, the religion of emotionism, and the religion of easy believism. And this legalism is what appears to be great on the outside, but at its core is rotten. This leaven as we, were, we learned a couple of weeks ago, uh, permeates the entire loaf, corrupting the entire bread, not just part of it. And the gospel of legalism is syncretism. It's in the search of more rules and regulations to cover up the true diagnosis of the heart, to try to gain control for yourself, to try to earn favor with God through all these rules and regulations. So it's not unlike many uh, religions of the world, such as Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, where you have to work towards uh, getting right with God. So you could say legalism has more in common with these worldly religions than Christianity, which is based on grace. So we need discernment here and reflect to make sure that we are not swayed by legalism. First, we need to recognize the idol here, which would be the boastful pride of life and how we can perceive and, 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 uh, and be wary of this idol in our lives. They, you see, you're not worshiping God when you're adherent to this religion. And we have to take spiritual inventory to make sure that we are not like the Pharisees and Sadducees. I'm going to ask you several questions in order to take this spiritual inventory of ourselves. The first one, and don't say this out loud, the first one is, are you the best Christian that you know? Meaning, as you look around at your peers, you think you're at a higher spiritual level than others. Don't look at your neighbors. Do you feel as though everyone else is in theological error except for you? That when you read the the Bible, God reveals truths that He doesn't reveal to anyone else. This is seen from preachers like on late night TV when they're peddling their new books saying that God has given them a new revelation about Hosea 1 that nobody else has ever uh, has ever received in 2,000 years of church history. The third question is, do you ever wonder why people never come to you with their spiritual issues? 
even though they know you're a Christian, nobody ever comes up to you and asks you to pray for them or question about your beliefs. Instead, they try to avoid you. Now, if you say yes to any of these, if you're honest, or leaning towards yes does not necessarily mean you're a legalist, but it does provide indicators to look inside yourself spiritually and go a little bit further whether or not you are a legalist and struggle with this. And if you find yourself at yes at any point, then I would say quit being the star of your life and put Jesus at, its, as your, at your right center. Now, as we take spiritual inventory of our lives, this means that we have to not only know orthodoxy, which leads to orthopraxy, meaning that we have to have the right beliefs in order to have right practice. And we don't have to do this alone. We do this in the community of Christ. We do this amongst our brothers and sisters. So if we can truly be honest with ourselves and whether or not we are swayed with maybe adding more rules and regulations in order to cover up an idol in our lives, let us be honest with our, with our small groups. Let us be honest with our brothers and sisters in the Lord as we all struggle together and become more and more like Christ. Our next false teaching comes in the way of false security that we get from emotional, emotionism. The religion of emotionism throws out all the rules and regulations and instead adopts fuzzy goosebumps and butterflies in the stomach rather than cognitive thought. Rather than going deeper with God, you take clues from the warm and fuzzy feeling that you get after a sermon that is validation for yourself that you're right with God. Or that good feeling that you get after a worship song. All good things, but in this instance, is a cover trying to cover up the real diagnosis of your heart. You say you're fine because you get emotional during a, singing a hymn or after a sermon. So this means that you must be okay in continuing your inappropriate emotional relationship at work. That everything is fine because you have this some sort of feeling and emotion, and everybody sins anyways, so it's okay to continue to cuss and to live a life of uh, given to sin. So it's okay to continue thoughts about the video game that you, th you may be thinking of right now or worry so much about what other people are saying in social media about you. At the center of this gospel is presumptuous because you're presuming that you're right with God based on some emotional feel, rather than being grounded in Scripture. And that's what we have to do in order to combat this religion of emotionism. Instead of frailing to and fro in emotionism, we have to ground ourselves in God's truth. Proverbs 15.14 says, The discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of the fool feeds on folly. So we have to make sure that we ground ourselves in the truth of God and we have to actively ask questions about whether or not our passion, our emotion is coming truly from the study of God's Word. See, as we dig deeper in theology, we have deeper emotions for God. And they go in tandem. So, read widely. Choose reformers to read from, Puritans. Ask your small group leaders what they're reading in order for you to learn more about God, to know Him more, to have a robust theolog the theology to lead to deeper and more profound emotion. The next and our last false religion of hypocrisy is the religion of easy believism. And this is on the other side of the coin to legalism. It throws out all the rules and regulations. This teaching says that you are okay with God because you made a prayer when you were six years old at a church camp. 
or 13 with that spiky-haired, tattooed youth pastor. And so since you made a consent to knowing the Lord, then you're okay with living however you want to live. You don't actually need to repent and live a life devoted to God. At the center of this hypocrisy of religion is the gospel of reductionism. Because you reduce the Bible, throw out all different sections of the Bible that may seem unpalatable for you and in conflict with the world standards. And it's reduced to how to anything that is not going to ruffle any feathers. It gives you the pass and the power to say to others of the world, oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those Christians. I'm not one of those Christians that believe that abortion is a sin because it's between a conversation between a mother and their doctor. Oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those Christians. I cuss sometimes when I stub my toe or when somebody cuts me off in traffic. Oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those Christians that believe homosexuality is a sin. Oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those Christians that don't watch shows because of multiple explicit sex scenes. And on and on we go, chopping sections of Scripture like you're playing a game of Fruit Ninja. It's really easy to see the attraction here, isn't it? The idols can be comfort. Because, please don't bother bother me by going and trying to do things harder for God. Or convenience. It would be too much trouble to believe more. Or safety. It's safer to fear man. Comfort, convenience, and safety are all good things. But as we remember, idolatry is taking good things and making it the center of our lives. And I do think that this one in particular is making a major comeback in our society. The temptation to conform your standards to the world instead of calling the world to conform to God's standards. You worry more about what people think rather than pleasing God. So you pattern yourself after the world from the entertainment you consume, from the conversations you choose to engage in, and from the sin you put up with out of fear of being rejected. Your world then is determined by trendy, faddish philosophies of the day rather than God's Word. You seek popular opinion over seeking God's opinion. So how can we steer clear of this hypocrisy? We must recognize true discipleship and what that is. And Jesus has taught us very clearly what a true disciple looks like. Jesus tells us to take up our cross daily and follow Him. And it's not always going to be comfortable, convenient, or safe. But neither was the cross that Jesus bore on your behalf. Jesus left the heavenly realm, stepped into ours to live a life that we never could and to die a bloody death for the forgiveness of our sins. See, later in the Gospel of Matthew, we see the same people who Jesus ministered to, who He fed, mock and spit in His face. We see Jesus going down a road to His death with blood in His face from the crown of thorns put on Him. He laid upon that cross, beaten, mocked, and naked, unashamed, For you, as the Father turned His face away. The only innocent and greatest injustice of all time was done so that you may not get justice. Do you still want to reduce that Scripture? Do you still want to cower in fear of man? Man? 
I say be bold and stand firm by believing in what God has revealed from Genesis to Revelation. And know, Christians, why we follow and worship Him alone. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 11, it says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus and by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together as the habit of some, but encouraging another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Some years later, Chuck, after writing his famous book, Farewell to God, Lee Strobel, for his new book, The Case for Christ, came to Chuck asking him questions. He asked, after all these many decades, what does he think about Jesus now? When he asked him this question, Lee said that his whole continence changed and that he became more relaxed as he reflected upon Jesus. He said through all his studies, that everything that the world had offered, he came back and said that Jesus was still the greatest person that he ever knew, that he had the highest moral ethic than any other man that ever walked the face of the earth. And quite frankly, I miss him. Not soon after, Chuck had died. Seemingly never being restored, to the one who saved him after that bar fight so many years ago. So I have no idea where you're at this morning, whether or not you're just going through the motions, waiting for lunch. I do not know whether or not you've been trying so hard to earn favor with God. I don't know if you're depending on some sort of emotional feeling in order to make you feel right or think Convince yourself that you're right with God. I don't know if you've been struggling with easy believism, reducing Scripture, because, hey, who's to say you're in theological error anyways? That's rude. We don't say people are in wrong anymore. Maybe you are a completely different person during the week because you've reduced your beliefs down so much so that if we were to see you outside of church, we wouldn't even recognize who you are. I don't know where you're at. But as for me, several years ago now, God met me at my greatest, greatest time. And God saved me even though I thought I was unsavable. It was emotional for me, but those emotions were then validated through my study of God's Word. And if anyone was a bad guy, it was me. If anyone deserved justice, it was me. But instead, God showed me mercy. 
So wherever you're at, wherever you find yourself today, I want you to stop trying to elevate yourself to God with idols. I want you to smash down those idols in a commitment to the Lord. God has shown us the sign of Jonah, and it's a special thing. He rose from the dead. And through that sign of Jonah, there was two choices that these groups made. The Pharisees and Sadducees decided to leave Jesus. And in A.D. 70, after the, the destruction of the temple, the Sadducees fall off the face of history. The Pharisees, well, have you seen one lately? But God's Word and His kingdom still endures. As we find out just a couple of verses later, the disciples in verse 12 say they finally understood, but then later, Peter really does get it. He says, Jesus, you are the Christ. And Jesus tells this to Peter, that this revelation was not given to you by flesh and blood, but by the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives us this promise as we look towards the end of the Gospel of Matthew, that he would truly be with us even to the end of the age. We have such a great promise in the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might have the righteousness of God. So Christians, I ask you this morning to look inside yourselves and ask where are those areas that you need to take in spiritual inventory? Where are those areas that you need to ground yourself in the truth of God? Where are there areas in which you need to follow Him more closely? Where you need to believe Him more? And if you're not a Christian, I pray that you know that a sign from heaven was given to you. A sign in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you recognize this this morning. Let's pray.